Welcome in, welcome back to another episode of the Touchdown Black and Gold Vlog, where we discuss, celebrate, and honor all things college football with a very special emphasis on the black and gold squads of the Missouri Tigers and the Iowa Hawkeyes. Welcome to Championship Week. It is great to be back here with you on the Touchdown Black and Gold Vlog. This is my normal midweek show, but today's episode is a very special midweek episode. I will do some things that I normally have done throughout the entire season, such as I will share with you my updated uh, Heisman Trophy race, the candidates on my short list, who I think is in, who is out, and who may ultimately take home the trophy fr from NYC. I also am going to share with you some updated headlines and storylines dealing with the ever-evolving, wacky, out-of-control coaching carousel because we had some major, groundbreaking, earth-shattering news about some coaching vacancies that had been filled within the last handful of days. And then kind of the special segment of my midweek show today is I'm going to go in depth and have a dissection of the Big Ten title game between our Iowa Hawkeyes and the Michigan Wolverines. So definitely want to stay tuned to hear what I have to say about the big game on Saturday evening. I am not going to give you a prediction. That'll come tomorrow during my big championship weekend preview show. Once again, thank you, and I really support, and thank you for your support, your time. As always, this is only possible because of all of you, the Black and Gold family. I always ask for and welcome any likes, any shares. Feel free to subscribe, comment. Let's spread the, let's spread the news and get rally all college football fans from near and far black and gold fans alike together to spread the love of the Touchdown Black and Gold vlog. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. And sorry, I'm your usual host, Blair Parks. Holla at you, boy! And it's great to be back here with you. And what a week it is going to be. It is so bittersweet knowing the regular season has come to a end like that, it just flew by as it tends to do year in and year out. But it is awesome that we have conference football title games on the docket for Friday and Saturday. And it is awesome. A little bit unexpected, but definitely welcome to have one of our black and golds, the Iowa Hawkeyes, in one of the conference title games to where going back to spring football, summer camp, fall camp, when each of these teams, each of these coaching staffs, they put together their goals for the upcoming season, one that is shared by every team at the Division I level is to win your conference crown. So right now we have 20 teams who will be vying to check off one of those goals that they had coming into the season. And I am so blessed and happy and fortunate that one of those teams is Iowa. But stand by for that in-depth preview. Let's go ahead and start the episode, shall we? So where I want to begin today is give you my updated Heisman Trophy race. I mean, it's going to really come down to this weekend. I mean, who is going to make a lasting impression to the voters for this award, because quite honestly, right now, I don't know how much separation there is. I can't tell you who I believe is going to take home the trophy, because time and time again, we've seen some of these candidates rise with a couple of stud efforts and then fall with poor efforts. And it seems like nobody wants to take charge or take the bull by the horn, so to speak, to get out in front. So this why this is a very tough Heisman Trophy race, and it really reflects the kind of season that we have witnessed. A season like none other with the parody, the chaos, 
and also a season that it has taught us one thing, not to assume or expect anything. Maybe even to expect the unexpected is what this season has taught us. So here is my short list. To me, these are the individuals who I think right now, as of now, going into conference championship week, would get an invite to the New York City Athletic Club. Club, And there is one name that is joining my list, making his debut. Let's start off with the usual suspects. Alabama quarterback Bryce Young, and I believe right now he probably is the front runner by a nose. Next is the Ohio State quarterback, C.J. Stroud. Unfortunately, he is not going to have a Heisman uh, potential moment this weekend during the conference championships because Michigan knocked off Ohio State. So C.J. Stroud is absolutely in the running, but I think he is going to need a little bit of help. Next is the Ole Miss quarterback, the do-all-do-everything quarterback, Matt Corral. His season is over until the Sugar Bowl, which is where Ole Miss will land. Um, went 10-2, and two, primarily because of his efforts, an excellent season. He really was the player, I think, that meant the most to his team as far as getting to the double-digit uh, uh, category, getting to that 10 wins. Now, this is the... New addition to my short list, because I've already said, I don't know right now which of these three quarterbacks really has had that Heisman moment. I don't really know who deserves it or who wants it. I mean, Bryce Young will have his potential Heisman moment this weekend when Alabama takes on number one ranked and undefeated Georgia. If he knocks them off, if he's even if he looks pedestrian, but yet he leads the tide to a victory, I think at that point, you can basically bet on uh, Bryce Young bringing home the Heisman Trophy. But we've seen this Georgia defense shut down everybody this year. So if he looks pedestrian at best in a loss, at that point, we're back to square one. I don't know who deserves this award. And like I said, C.J. Stroud is going to be have to just be on the outside looking in, hurry up and wait, as of Matt Corral. And the reason why I'm focusing right now on these first three quarterbacks is, in years past, it has really gone to the offensive MVP of a team. That's unfortunately what this award has morphed into, all right? But right now, offensively, I mean, who gets it? Who does it go to? And that's why this person has now joined the shortlist. I am going to add a defender. The person that I think has stood out and really has led his team to the potential playoff promised land for the first time. I'm talking about Michigan defensive end Aiden Hutchinson, who now has 13 sacks on the season. And if he does record a couple sacks against our Hawkeyes, I definitely think he will garter and earn an invite to NYC for the potential trophy. And I definitely think a defender has played their way in because of the lack of anyone taking the lead. Now, the Georgia defense absolutely is the best defense in the nation, one of the best defenses we've actually seen in a while. But all of them chip in. There's not really one uh, stud, one dude, whose stats stick out to where, wow, that cat is definitely the best player on that vaunted defense. They don't really have that person. That's why I think I can't really necessarily put one of the Georgia defenders in this category for winning the Heisman. But Aiden Hutchinson absolutely is on the map. He is on the radar. He's arrived. But let's see what he does against our beloved Hawkeyes. That might be one of the keys to victory for either team. Stay tuned, and you'll hear what I have to say about the uh, Big Ten preview show. Now, the individual that I have been lauding for, that I've applauded for several weeks, I believe this individual should also make the Heisman Trophy finalist list. That is Western Kentucky quarterback Bailey Zappi, who has zapped the entire competition they have won seven straight victories, have the Hilltoppers, by a margin of 26 points average. 
and they have advanced to the Conference USA title game. That's a Friday night kickoff, a Friday night game. I will be watching against a very vaunted and tough UTSA squad that was previously ranked and undefeated going in to rivalry week, week 13, but they were knocked off by the North Texas Mean Green. So now the, if Western Kentucky beats UTSA, the Roadrunners, Mimi, it might take a little bit away from that victory. But Bailey Zappi is hands down the best player at the non-Power 5 level. And that's why no matter how good someone performs at that level, outside of the non-Power 5 conferences, they will never, ever get an invite to New York City. But his numbers don't only reflect him being the best player at the non-Power 5 group or level, but his numbers are better than any of the three quarterbacks on my short list. Just listen to the stats. They speak for themselves. Right now, Zappi season stats, 4,968 yards, 52 touchdowns to nine interceptions. Yeah, that's a little bit high, but still, 52 to nine. We'll all take that, that ratio. Uh, he's completed 70% of his passes with a QBR of 76.5. Now, let me compare that to what I believe is the slight front runner in Alabama quarterback Bryce Young. Young season stats, 3,901 yards, 40 touchdowns to four picks, completion percentage of 68%, and a QBR of 86.7. So Zappi is ahead of him in yards by 1,000 yards, and he has 12 touchdowns on him. These stats you cannot compare, especially when Bryce Young has way more talent around him. Remember, the story about Bailey Zappi itself is so intriguing. This cat who, let me, let me just pause where I am right now, and this is why I'm going to say how impressive this story and this season is, is that when you look at the NCAA records for passing yards in a season and passing touchdowns a season, he legitimately can break these. He has two games left. I absolutely think he will break the touchdowns record. Now, the yards passing in a season, that might be a stretch, but it's possible. Joe Burrow, two years ago, during what we called the best offensive team, maybe the best offensive season of any team ever in the history of college football, that vaunted LSU squad, which... Ironically, coach Ed Ogeron, go Tigers, is now fired, has been released two years after winning a national title. That's just where we are right now in the college football landscape. But Joe Burrow threw for 60 touchdowns. That was the record. Zappi is only eight behind him. I absolutely believe he will catch and pass Joe Burrow for that record. Now, the season record for most passing yards is currently held by B.J. Simons, I believe, was at Texas Tech. He threw for 5,833 yards. That is mighty impressive. So Zappi is behind him by 800 yards and change. He absolutely can get there. And let's say that happens. You're going to have this cat go into the record books, but not even get any Heisman Trophy love. That is highway robbery. And when you compare him to the other front runners, there's no comparison. I mean, when you look at C.J. Stroud's uh, season numbers, C.J. Stroud is at 3,862 yards passing, 38 touchdowns to five interceptions, 71% completion rate, 89.8 QBR. So Zappi's numbers, you cannot even compare. Get Bailey Zappi to New York City. Yes, maybe he should not win, but we need to give credit where credit is due, especially in this season that we've had. Get him to New York City. Call up your local congressman. Call up your local newspaper, your local sport outfit, um, outlet and affiliate. Get them on board. Let's get Bailey. Let's do the right thing. So that right now is where I have the Heisman Trophy race. It's going to come down, I think, to who performs this weekend. But I'm still hoping Bailey Zappi will get there because he absolutely has deserved it. And to finish up my story about how it is such an inspiring story, here he is on the precipice of breaking those two records. 
but this cat did not get a single scholarship offer at the Division I level. This time last year, he was quarterbacking at FCS Houston Baptist. And now look where he is. Western Kentucky could absolutely win the game against UTSA, be crowned Conference USA champs. I mean, it's just do the right thing, please. In a world where I know common sense isn't really common anymore, this is what we call a Grenada, a slam dunk. He should be there. All right. So that's where I am with the updated Heisman Trophy race. Next segment for storylines and headlines is the updated coaching carousel. And we, to say we've had movement is not, is not really a proper description. We have had so much news breaking in the last handful of days about coaches being hired here, coaches on the move. Let me just bring it to you right now. We have some uh, coaching vacancies that have been filled. First at Florida, it was filled by Billy Napier, the former coach of the Louisiana Ragin' Cajuns, whose team will be playing this Saturday night against Appalachian State in the Sun Belt title game. He will not be coaching in that game. TCU was the TCU position was filled by Sonny Dykes, the former head coach at SMU. Washington. Washington filled their vacancy with uh, Kalen DeBoer, formerly the head coach of the Fresno State Bulldogs. Washington State, they announced their head coach as well, filled by Jake Dickert, who was the former interim coach at Washington State, but he got awarded the full-time position with how they ended their season. Well done. Uh, Virginia Tech. Now, this is a surprise. Virginia Tech hired their replacement. They hired uh, Brent Pry, who is the former defensive coordinator at Penn State. A little bit of a surprise there. Now we have the ones that have absolutely sent shockwaves through the entire college football landscape. USC. That's right. If you recall, USC fired Clay Helton after week two when the USC Trojans were embarrassed at home by the Stanford. They have filled their position and what I believe is one of the top 10, if not top five jobs in the nation. Somebody completely off the radar, big time shock and surprise, but a huge hire. They were able to lure Lincoln Riley to take the job at USC, the former head coach at Oklahoma. Hardly ever do we see this happen where a coach leaves on their own, on their own terms, a destination job, like in Oklahoma, a blue blood program, and then go to another blue blood. We hardly ever see this happen, but we've seen it happen twice this week. Listen to the next one. LSU, that's right, another top 10 job in the, uh, in the nation, another blue blood. They made a huge splash. They lured Brian Kelly from Notre Dame to be their next head football coach. That's not a big surprise, Brian Kelly leaving Notre Dame. He was really involved very highly in potentially going to USC. But for him to go to LSU, that is a surprise. So once again, Notre Dame, a destination dream job, blue blood program, we see another coach leave that for another blue blood. We have not seen this forever. And I told you, and I've been saying for weeks, this was going to be the greatest coaching carousel that we will ever, ever witness in our lifetime. So now what does that mean? We have two openings at two more Blue Blood programs. We have a vacancy at Notre Dame and Oklahoma. Who saw this coming? Nobody. And right now there is a lot of disappointment, a lot of feelings going on with the Oklahoma fans, Notre Dame fans alike, a lot of anger, calling these two individuals backstabbers, they're snakes slithering around, how could they do this? But this is the profession that they now are in. These were great opportunities for them. I don't believe there should be any ill will by these fan bases because of what these two individuals have done for them. And they will hire, they will make a big splash hiring. They will be fine. They're in great positions. They're still 
um, two of the very short list of haves in college football. Listen to what uh, Lincoln Riley did at Oklahoma. He led them to three playoff appearances, four Big 12 titles, and two Heisman Trophy winners. So Oklahoma fans rejoice and give thanks for what he's done for you. And remember, this cat was handed a premier Cadillac convertible, the keys from Bob Stoops when he stepped away. So he got handed the keys to this dream job, but yet now he's taking his talents to USC. And look at what Brian Kelly did at Notre Dame. And I'm going to say this first and then backtrack. He took Notre Dame to two playoff appearances, one national title game in the BCS era at Notre Dame, and they're right now in playoff contention for this year. What he has done there, I think Brian Kelly, whether you like him or don't like him, he has been so underappreciated at Notre Dame. I said this several weeks ago. Uh, during, this week, during this season with wins, he passed the legendary Newt Rockney as the winningest coach in Notre Dame history. Still, it seemed like he was not ever really um, celebrated for the coach he is. He was never somebody who they really understood how privileged they were to have him, especially with the academic restrictions at Notre Dame. This is a team... That This isn't the 80s anymore. Once Notre Dame did that to themselves, making it tough for academic admissions, no, they will never win a national title at Notre Dame. So how steady and solid my, uh, Brian Kelly has been as your coach, you should be more than grateful and happy for him. This is a good opportunity for him to go to LSU when the last, what, three coaches at LSU, by the way, have won national titles in Nick Saban, Les Miles, and Ed Ogeron. So there you go. But yeah, it's, it's so incredibly difficult at Notre Dame to get the job done with their academic restrictions. They can't recruit with the Alabamas, uh, with the Ohio States, with the Oklahomas, even though expectations are exactly the same by their, uh, by their fans by that program is they expect you to be in the playoff hunt each and every year. And what he has done cannot be overstated. Well done. Congrats to both of these coaches. Best of luck. And I think they are slam dunk hires, especially USC. Lincoln Riley with his offensive uh, prowess, his system. Absolutely. I think that'll keep Southern California kids at home. I give them two, maybe three years. And I believe they will help rejuvenate, be a shot in the arm for the Pac-12 to where now you're going to potentially have two heavyweights, uh, two coaches who are excellent recruiters and Mario Cristobal at Oregon and Lincoln Riley at USC. And this is exactly what the Pac-12, the Conference of Champions, needed. So congratulations. I will definitely keep you up to speed on more of these uh, hirings and vacancies as they arise, because there will still be plenty. And now it definitely it broke this week, as I predicted. We have an additional opening at a Power 5 program. Duke and David Cutcliffe have parted ways. His time in, uh, in Duke is done. He's had a great career, so best of luck to David Cutcliffe. But now we have another head coaching position at the Power 5 level available. So what a coaching carousel it has already turned out to be, as somebody predicted. Little, you know, pat on the back. You know, I'm, I'm going to do it when I can. I don't know everything. I never claim to know it, know it all. I mean, I've even said here in front of all of you, you know, my people, my family, my friends, that you know, I am dumber than a box of sand. I am. I admit that. But I know a thing or two about this great game. So next week. I'll definitely bring you up to speed on further movings and happenings and reactions in the coaching carousel world. All right, so now we come to a special segment during my midweek show. I already told you I'm excited to do this. Give me about 20 minutes or so, give or take. I'm going to break down an in-depth preview of the Big Ten title game between Michigan and Iowa. 
So let me start off with saying who and when. That's who it is, number 13, Iowa. That is their new ranking via last night's playoff rankings that were unveiled. And number two, Michigan. That's right, the second best team in the nation. 7 p.m. is kickoff. Here's Central Time from Indianapolis, Indiana, and the Lucas Oil uh, Arena. I don't know if you call that a dome. I think this is called an arena, but it is closed. It is a closed arena. Uh, the records, Michigan comes in at 11-1, 8-1 in the Big Ten. Iowa, 10-2, 7-2 in the Big Ten. Michigan, right now, it opened and they've stayed as a 10.5 point favorite. The over and under is, is 43.5. That does sound about right to me. I think by the time kickoff rolls around Michigan, that might drop to 9.5, maybe a 9 point favorite. But make no mistake about it. I mean, you know me. I haven't said this in a very long time to all of you, but I am a non-biased fan. Yes, I root for our Hawkeyes. That's where my passion is. But I have I think I have been able to operate from a non-biased point of view the entire season. I am not a Homer Simpson. I look at things subjectively and tell you. And I'll say right now, absolutely without doubt Michigan is the better team of these two they are statistically eyeball test their resume is a little bit better than Iowa's they are the better team so they should be favored now the over under at 43.5 if I was a betting man and this might be a big surprise to some of you because both of these teams are very stout defensively I would take the over I think there will be more points scored in this game than what is being anticipated. So I would take the over, surprisingly. But once again, don't hold me to bay for that. I'm not telling you to put a second mortgage on your house. Don't bet your children's college tuitions. Don't put that evil on me, Bobby, in case you lose. All right? Don't put that, don't put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. I don't want to be held accountable for that. So that's the records of these two teams. And let's go with next, what's at stake? And I just said the rankings. Iowa, if they win, probably absolutely will be in the Rose Bowl on January 1st, which to me is the, you know, the granddaddy of them all. That is the precipice for me as an Iowa fan. As you can tell, I'm wearing a Rose Bowl shirt from our last appearance at the end of the 2015 season. 2016, January 1st, the Rose Bowl against Stanford it did not go quite the way Iowa and our us fans wanted it to go. But that's what where we're hoping to get back to. And there might even be an outside chance for more. I'll indulge that possibility at the end of this uh, preview. So Iowa playing for a Rose Bowl bid. Michigan, it simply comes down to this. You win the conference title. You beat Iowa. You are going to grab a playoff bid, and you'll be in the college football playoff for your first time. That's what it comes down to. High stakes for both teams, but especially for Michigan. So that is what they are playing for. Now, this is what we can expect. And before I do that, I've got to say right now a little half-standing ovation for Coach Jim Harbaugh, the khakis. What a bounce back year in the offseason, going two and four, getting a major haircut, a shave, his salary cut in half. On the hot seat, he responds with this kind of a season. And I'd said earlier this year, there was no expectation, no sort of anything on this Michigan football team. I thought they could be dangerous. And look at what's happened. That's exactly what has come to fruition. But he is right now on the precipice of taking care of all four goals he was brought in to do. He was brought in, first of all, to beat Ohio State. You can check that one off. To win the Big Ten East crown. He did that. And now to get to win the Big Ten title, he's going to have a chance at that. And then get to the college football playoff. So what a season he's had. Well done, uh, Coach Harbaugh. Great comeback season. Um, but this is what we can expect from this game. These two teams want to control the lines of scrimmage and be run heavy on offense, which then sets up the play action. 
it's going to be a good old-fashioned Big Ten backyard brawl. That's what we can expect. It's going to be potentially ugly at times, but that's why I believe Iowa has every opportunity and chance to upset Michigan because they basically want to run the same styles, both offensively, defensively. They are both very uh, stout, and they invest big time in their special teams. So that's why Iowa, I think, actually matches up pretty well with Michigan. They're going to have every opportunity to pull this upset because of that. Both teams are excellent, like I said, at special teams. I mean, when you look at the stats... Field goal kicking, punting average, uh, return average, it is almost identical except for one thing, and I'll share that here in a little bit. So the special teams are kind of a wash. They both excel in special teams and defensively. Both of these teams are top 20 defenses. Iowa's stats overall, they are a better defense than Michigan's when you look at the stat sheet. So defensively, they are both superior as well. So let's look at the matchup straight up. Let's compare each defense versus defense for Michigan and Iowa. Michigan, they gave up 196 yards passing a game, 122 yards rushing per game, and 17 points per game. Pretty good. The Iowa defense, we're looking at giving up 210 passing yards a game, 105 rushing yards per game, and also 17 points per game. So these defenses all, all almost basically mirror each other. So there's not really much of an advantage for either defense as well. So once again, it bodes well for a potential shocking upset. Now let's look at the offensive numbers. Offense versus offense. And yeah, just to give you a little bit of warning, if you're an Iowa fan... Look the other way, cover your ears, because this is something we cannot really compare. Michigan's offense, they average 226 passing yards per game, 225 yards on the ground, 37 points per game. The Iowa offense, ugh, this is not a typo. I, checked my, I put my list, I checked it twice in the season of Christmas. Iowa Averages 178 passing yards per game, 121 on the ground, and 26 points per game. So absolutely, Michigan has the they have a huge uh, advantage offensively. But in a little bit, I'm going to say why I think Iowa could maybe counterbalance some of that to where 225 rushing yards for the Wolverines. I mean, they rushed for just under 300 yards against their rival Ohio State uh, last week. But I definitely don't think they're going to be able to rush for 200 yards or even near 300 against this Iowa defense that I think is a little bit more stout, disciplined, and they scheme better. So I don't think they're going to get um, over their average. I definitely think Iowa will be able to slow them down on the ground. That'll be an advantage for Iowa and really a key to their victory. So going into that, let's look at the keys to victory in this big time matchup. Michigan, run, Forrest, run. That's what they want to do. They want to run first, run second, and run third. They don't want to put the ball game on the shoulders and in the arm of quarterback Cade McNamara. Now, he has improved throughout this season and from last year. If you look at him on the field, his stats, he definitely has made progress. But they definitely don't want him throwing more than 30 times in a game. That's not Michigan's offensive plan. So their key to victory, run the ball, control the line of scrimmage, and also, they want to create chaos along the defensive line play and just have at it, feast on the quarterbacks. And this is what really scares me. Because the two stud uh, Michigan uh, defensive ends, and I said one of them is now on my short list for the Heisman Trophy uh, candidacy for consideration. Aiden Hutchinson's on one side of that vaunted 
uh, Michigan defensive front with 13 sacks. So you might think, I can maybe double team him. But on the other side, his partner in crime, David Ajabo, has 11 sacks on the season. So that's what Michigan also wants to do. Get to the quarterback, break up the passing rhythm, tackles for loss, sacks, uh, improve their field position, maybe get a strip sack. That's what they want to do. That's another key to Michigan's victory is to create chaos and havoc on the defensive front. Um, yeah, and it's going to it's really going to be the matchup to watch. Um, Iowa's keys to victory is do your best to contain those defensive studs, those, def those defensive ends, that duo, that dynamic duo of Hutchinson and Ojabo. And I'm going to say right now, that to me is the ultimate deciding factor in who wins this game. I think it's going to be ugly at times. We all know Iowa has been challenged offensively during this season from time to time. Well, probably more consistently yes than no. But can they at least slow down those two edge rushers? They will get their tackles. They'll get their sacks. It's going to be impossible for them to shut them out. If they do, then they absolutely should probably win the game. But that's asking way too much. So that is the key matchup. Can Iowa's young tackles, who have struggled, and that really, to me, if you have been watching uh, past episodes, that has been the key to Iowa's offensive woes all season, has been their offensive line play. It has looked a little bit better the last few weeks, but this is where I believe this game is going to be won or lost for either team. Iowa has to try just to slow those two studs down. You know, you shut them out, great, but don't let them have their way. Keep the pocket as clean as possible. Give your quarterbacks, whether it's Alex Padilla or Spencer Petras, some time to go through progressions and throw the ball. And also try to hold down the line of scrimmage, the point of attack, and create some running lanes for your rushing attack. So that is the key. That's going to be the key matchup I'm watching during this game on Saturday night. So Iowa's keys to victory, other than slowing those two down, is take care of, the, of their most prized possession, the football. You have to not turn the ball over to have any shot at winning this ball game. And also, vice versa, you need to win. Take the ball away a couple times from Michigan. Give yourself a couple extra possessions. I think that has to happen as well. Iowa can't turn it over, and their defense has to create a couple of turnovers. And I feel good about that. Like I said, Michigan does not want Cade McNamara to air the ball out 30 times a game. If he has to do that, if they become more one-dimensional than not, that actually bodes well for Iowa. Their, uh, their back seven, their linebacker core, but especially their defensive backfield, they have played at the next level, the highest level all season. They lead the nation, you know, as a reminder, with 22 interceptions. So it's actually, that's what Iowa wants. If it has to come down to Caden McNamara throwing the ball to beat Iowa, I'll take Iowa's chances. Yes, downfield, if they take some one-on-one -on -one deep shots, which they will, they might convert a couple. But Iowa is absolutely going to win some of those battles, hopefully via an interception or two. So that's what Iowa wants Michigan to do. Force them into throwing the ball when they have to, not necessarily when they want to. That's another key to Iowa's victory in this game. Also, Iowa has to get some traction in the run game. Tyler Goodson coming off a 150-yard performance last week on Black Friday against Nebraska. That's what he's going to have to do. Their running game, Iowa has to find a way to at least get to 150, 175 yards running between Tyler Goodson and Gavin Newsom. Maybe even we, maybe even we see Ivory Kelly Martin to get a couple of uh, uh, rushing attempts. So that's going to be it. That's going to be the keys to victory and Iowa also has to win the special teams battle and field position. 
and that's been their recipe for success all season. Offense, do what you can. Just don't put us in bad situations. Don't turn it over. Don't give up, you know, a pick six, uh, you know, intercept a pick six, a scoop six. Don't take bad sacks to push us out of field goal range. Let's just let the Iowa defense and special teams do what they do. So that's going to be the keys to victory for both of these squads. Can't wait to see how that plays out. Now let me share with you some game changers in this game for both teams. For Michigan, their defensive ends, they are game changers. And if Aiden has himself a big day, he absolutely will be in New York City, as I've already shared with you. Also, they have a stable of running backs. They have a three-headed monster, uh, none stronger than um, Hassan Haskins, Blake Corum, and Edwards. They have three running backs who are proven, so they will have fresh legs on the field throughout the game. And once again, that's what Michigan wants to do is run, run, run. And that's going to be their game changers, their ends and their running backs for Iowa already brought it up, is their, def is their defensive back seven, linebackers, defensive backs, you know, tackling in space, limiting the big chunk plays. Michigan will have a couple of those, but try not to give up huge chunk plays consistently and get a couple of turnovers. That's the Iowa's game changers. And also, I'm going to say it, I did say earlier this segment that both these special team units are studs they're advanced they are next level i mean next sport even they are excellent at what they do but iowa has the potential game changer in my guy charlie jones their kick returner who just got named the uh i forget the actual award name but what it was is the best kick returner pump returner in the big 10 he is not i don't want to say a secret weapon michigan knows about him but Charlie Jones has got to do what he does. He has got to ball out and give us a few extra yards here and there when Iowa uh, forces Michigan to punt or, do, or during kickoffs from Michigan. So Charlie Jones is going to be a big-time game changer or has to be for Iowa to win. So that's where I see this game at, and I'm so excited. Like I said, I think this matchup is definitely, it bodes better for Iowa compared to playing the vaunted uh, offense of Ohio State, potentially. If that's what it would have played out to be, I I'd be a little bit more apprehensive of this. But I think because these two teams have the same styles, they have some familiarity in the Harbaugh era, they've met twice. Uh, they've split. Iowa beat them uh, the first meeting when they were number three in the nation undefeated. Never forget that game. I believe it was a walk-off field goal, 14-13 in Iowa City, late November. And the other game was 2018, I believe. It ended up being a 10-3 victory for Michigan in Ann Arbor in a game that was really just dominated by the Michigan defense. They recorded, I believe, nine sacks that day. Pretty ugly to watch. And Nate Stanley threw at least three, I want to say four interceptions. So there is some familiarity. Same styles. Iowa will have every chance to get the victory and advance to the Rose Bowl. And Michigan, they know what they have to do. Win, and you're in the playoffs. And another hidden advantage that Iowa might have that's not going to show up on any stat sheet, you're not going to see on the field, it might be discussed in the media but also the intangible factor of what just occurred for their program. A monumental victory over Ohio State. They have one week to come down off cloud nine. They're above cloud nine. They're in the upper atmosphere. I mean, they're, they're stuck in the, they're basically hovering the moon right now. So it comes down to can coach Jim Harbaugh bring his team back down to earth to regroup and refocus? Could there be a little bit of a letdown by Michigan against Iowa? Absolutely, considering those circumstances. They know Iowa's a solid team. There's no doubt about that. I'm not saying they're looking past Iowa, but in their minds all week they have heard how good they are, how great they are, what a big-time victory. Well, we just beat Ohio State. Now we have Iowa. I mean, yeah, they're okay, they're good, but 
We just beat the freaking Buckeyes. So that might be an intangible that could aid Iowa if Michigan is not able to block out some of the distractions and also knowing they are on the precipice of earning a playoff bid if they win. So that's something that I think can help Iowa. And also, Iowa's big wins this year, if you look at it right now, everybody expects Michigan to win. Well, maybe not everybody, but they are favored for a reason. They are a better team. Tune in tomorrow and I'll give you my official prediction for this game. But Iowa's big victories this year, in the media, it was all about the other team they were playing. Opening uh, game against number 17, Indiana, the, uh, the narrative was all about, you know, can Indiana... Uh, thrive? Can they continue uh, last season's success? We all know what happened. Iowa held them to a field goal. So maybe Kirk Ferentz used that as fuel to say, hey, they're coming to our house, but it's all about them. Same thing in the rivalry uh, game week two at Iowa State, ranked number eight inside the top 10. Game day was there. Biggest game ever in the history of this rivalry. Probably the biggest game ever for Iowa State in their program history. And still, Iowa, it was all about Iowa State and not Iowa. So maybe that helped fuel their motivation. And the Penn State game even. Number three versus number four. Penn State was number four at the time, but still it seemed to be a conclusion that Penn State was the better team they were going to win. So we, I've, we've seen this throughout this year to where when the narrative is against Iowa, they seem to rally. And even last week on Black Friday, coming into that game ranked number 16 against a 3-8 and eight squad, they were a one-point underdog on the road. So maybe this is something else that they can rally upon. We'll have to wait and see. But I can't wait for this game. Tune in tomorrow. I'll give you my prediction on this game and all of the conference uh, title games during my big championship weekend preview tomorrow. Now, the last thing I want to share with you, I've got to indulge just a little bit. I'll wrap this up. And I'm going to indulge these scenarios a little bit more on tomorrow's episode about if this team wins or that team wins, who's going to be the final four, whose names are we going to see, um... Um, said who is going to be making the playoff field when we hear those names announced on Sunday night. But right now, when you look at the top six, these are the teams that I believe are in the best position to get there. Number one's Georgia after last night. Number two, Michigan moved up three spots with their big win over Ohio State. Number three, Alabama. Number four, Cincinnati. Number five, Oklahoma State. They moved up two spots with their big win in Bedlam over Oklahoma. Notre Dame at number six, still right there, even though they don't have a coach right now. They are absolutely in playoff contention if some of those teams ahead of them lose. And if they do lose, I think Notre Dame will absolutely get a, a bid. Or then maybe you have Baylor at number nine as an outside looking in, because if they beat Oklahoma State, they'll have uh, pretty good victories down the stretch over a top 10 Oklahoma squad and number five, Oklahoma State in the Big 12 title game. So maybe they can still get in. And then we have Iowa sitting there at number 13. I've got to just tell you this really quick. This scenario, if this, if total chaos happens, and like the Joker says, introduce a little chaos. And that is what this season has been. So thinking it could happen is not outside the realm of possibility. But this, I think, is too much to happen. But it starts off with this. Simply, it begins and ends with Iowa winning. If Iowa loses, doesn't really matter. But let's say Iowa wins Saturday night. All right, so they knock Michigan out of the college football playoff. They're the Big Ten title winner. They have uh, one of the best, if not biggest, win in the nation oh, the entire season over the second best team in the nation in Michigan. Let's say Georgia beats Alabama, which they are favored to beat the Crimson Tide. That knocks Alabama out of the playoff bid. I'm just marking these off as I go here. So Michigan loses, Alabama loses. Let's say Baylor knocks off a higher-ranked Oklahoma State squad. That knocks off the Cowboys. 
and Baylor's sitting there with two losses, just like Iowa. They're both conference uh, champion winners, but Iowa definitely has the better resume. They have a better victory over Michigan, and the two losses that both teams have, Baylor lost at Oklahoma State, not a bad loss, but a bad loss on the road to a 5-7 and seven TCU squad when Iowa's victories were at least to two teams with winning records who were ranked at the time in Purdue and Wisconsin. So I think Iowa's resume would definitely be a little bit better than Baylor's. So I'm going to check them off. And let's say Cincinnati loses to an underdog Houston squad, which, you know, when's the last time there's been no chatter of a team that wins 11 straight and nobody seems to be talking about Houston? They are, they have every opportunity to shock the college football world and beat Cincinnati, which would be heartbreaking having a non-Power 5 team squarely in if they win. But let's say Houston knocks off Cincinnati. So then it comes down to who is in the playoff. I think then you've got Georgia and Notre Dame. Those are your locks. Notre Dame does not play a conference title game as an independent. They're in. But then it comes down to the last two spots. And me, the way I look at it, is how can you keep the Big Ten champion out? Hands down, it's been one one of the two best conferences all year, and it has been. How can you keep them out? Yes, that would be a long way to jump up. If they were more sitting at number 11 or 10, I think they would have a better chance. It could be more justified, but not enough teams ahead of them lost during rivalry week, week 13. So that is asking a lot, Iowa fans and all of you college football fans. It is. But it is fun to kick around that scenario. But I, I definitely think if all of that chaos happens, should and could Iowa be the four seed as the Big Ten champion with two losses, two good losses, knocking off the number two team in the nation? Absolutely they could. But like I said, it all starts and ends with them either winning or losing, taking care of business themselves. So that's a lot of fun. But I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, comment, like, share, subscribe. I always appreciate it. And thank you, as always, for your support, your time. It's been an absolute pleasure this season. It is my absolute pleasure to be sharing my love and passion for college football with you. Uh, comment, let me know how I'm doing, if there's something that you'd like me to ask or present to the family, the black and gold family. By all means, fire away if there's something I've missed or if I've made a gaffe, I've screwed something up, call me out on it. I have no pride issues. So until tomorrow, make sure to tune in. I would say by early to late afternoon, the uh, conference championship preview show should be up for viewing. So until tomorrow, thank you for joining me on today's episode of the Touchdown Black and Gold Vlog. We'll see you tomorrow. Go Hawks!